a CNCF webinar on improving data locality for analytics jobs on Kubernetes using Alexio. I'm Karen Chu, Community Manager, or, sorry, Community Program Manager at Microsoft and Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today, Jean Pang, PMC Maintainer at Alexio, and Adit Madan, Software Engineer at Alexio. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you will not be able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel to drop in your questions there and we'll get through as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and, as su and is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. And with that, I will hand it over to Jean to kick off today's presentation. Hi, everyone. This is Adit. Um, I'm going to co-present the talk with my coworker and friend, Jean. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. So in the talk today, I'll begin with a quick introduction of Alexio for those who are not familiar with what Alexio is. Then I'll move on to describing how you would achieve data locality with Spark and Alexio without Kubernetes. And then I'll give a quick overview, a quick recap of uh, some Kubernetes basics that I'll use in the rest of the talk. And then I'll move on to talking about how we achieve locality with Spark on top of Alexio in Kubernetes, what the challenges are, and what the solutions that we have come up with. Towards the end, I'll hand it over to Jean, who will talk about some recent innovations for structured data with Alexia. With that outline, uh, let's begin. Uh, before I give you a brief introduction of what Alexio is, I'll start with uh, giving you some context of the evolution of the big data ecosystem. So if you look at the big data ecosystem as it started, uh, there used to be only one compute engine, which was Apache Hadoop, and only one storage engine, which was uh, Apache HDFS. So HDFS and uh, Hadoop were co-located on the same cluster where you have all of your big data and all of the processing and the storage used to be on the same cluster itself. But if you look at the big data ecosystem today, there are a lot more compute frameworks and a lot more storage frameworks as well. So you have things like Presto, Spark, Flink, each compute framework catered to a specific kind of workload. And also you have different kinds of storage systems uh, which are, are cheaper and more efficient in different scenarios. So it, these storage systems could be both on-premise, such as Ceph or HDFS, or in the cloud, such as Amazon S3, Google Cloud Storage, or uh, Azure Storage. So like, uh, like I was mentioning before, uh, initially we only had uh, co-located compute and storage, one big cluster which has all of your data and all of your compute. So what we observed uh, during this time was that typically these clusters were compute bound. So you have a large amount of compute jobs which are trying to crunch out data from a co-located HDFS, but it's running out of CPU resources. resources. But since the clusters were tied together, you had to scale both compute and storage together. So the model that people moved to after this was that they disaggregated compute and storage. So you would have a segregated set of nodes which would run your compute and occupy the CPU resources, and you would have a different kind, a different set of nodes which would have, uh, which would be storage heavy and have your HDFS cluster. But since all of the storage was still on HDFS, HDFS was is more expensive than some of the cheaper forms of storage available today, such as object storage. Now, if you look at um, the ecosystem uh, and the way it was. Uh, because the clusters were typically compute bound, uh, one way of uh, 
having a cheaper uh, form of processing was to burst the compute out into the cloud. So what you would do is you would move the compute into the cloud, but you would still access data which was present on premise. And uh, we moved away from just one compute framework and we started using more compute frameworks such as Presto and Spark. And also, like I was mentioning, uh, HDFS stopped being the only data storage. So HDFS was combined or even replaced with storage completely in the cloud or by or cheaper form of object storage on premise itself. So even though uh, there were all of these compute frameworks that came in, all of them wanted to access data through a familiar API. Uh, one popular API was the uh, is the HDFS compatible API, uh, the HDFS interface to access data, and uh, this is where Alexio comes in. So when you have a segregation of your compute and storage clusters. Uh, where the data itself and the, the storage cluster itself is not lo co-located with the compute resources. Alexio sits as a layer between the compute cluster and the storage cluster. Typically, Alexio is co-located with the compute cluster, and Alexio enables access of data from your storage clusters to the compute framework itself. Alexio also uh, is responsible for, for a couple of different things which I have on this slide. So the first thing that Alexio did when Alexio started as a, as a project about three, uh, about four years back was that um, Alexio provided, uh, provides a global namespace for all of your data. What this means is that if your, your compute application such as Spark is accessing data from um, different storage systems such as HDFS and S3, Alexio enables you to access both these storage systems as part of the same namespace, the same file system namespace. So you, so you could have a directory within Alexio pointing to HDFS and another directory within Alexio pointing to an object store. Now, uh, by locating Alexio close to the compute cluster, Alexio also acts as a cache, as, as a cache for your data which might be remote. So Alexio acts as both a read cache when accessing data from a remote storage for the first time, and also as a write cache when new data is written back by the compute framework and it can persist the data to the storage systems in the background asynchronously. Now after the first version of Alexio, uh, the next uh, the next step in the evolution of Luxio was uh, our certain data management features. So uh, if you, uh, a couple of slides back, I talked about how uh, uh, we saw people were migrating from big on-premise clusters where HDFS and Hadoop were co-located to uh, this to to the cloud in which they have uh, they could have a mix of HDFS and S3 uh, or other object storages as the storage system. So the data management features uh, baked into Alexio allow you to set policies to ease migration of data from HDFS to your object store. So you could set policies uh, which allow you to in, uh, to migrate the data based on access or based on a time interval. Now, some of the recent uh, innovations in Alexio include uh, what we call the structured data catalog and the data transformation uh, platform. Uh, these are some things which allow Alexio to be more than just a file system uh, and work well with data analytics engine. Uh, I won't speak about that too much as uh, Gene is going to talk about this towards the end of the talk. Okay, so uh, now that we have uh, a quick recap of what Alexio is, uh, I'll talk about why we need uh, a data, an access layer like Alexio in Kubernetes. So uh, 
the picture I have on the right side, uh, we have uh, Spark and Aluxio co-located on a set of Kubernetes nodes, uh, which is outlined by the blue Kubernetes cluster. Um, that's the way Aluxio is typically deployed, close to the compute. Um, and uh, you, in this picture, you can see that uh, Aluxio can access data from uh, one or more storage systems. So let, let's say that in this case, uh, Spark and Aluxio wants to access data from uh, an object store like Amazon S3. So some of the key features that Aluxio provides is that uh, it brings back data locality to your compute frameworks in a world in which compute and storage is segregated. So uh, object storages, uh, storage uh, typically located on hardware uh, custom, uh, custom design for storage uh, is always uh, segregated with your compute cluster. So in an environment like this, Aluxio will fetch data from your object storage onto the compute cluster on the first access, and all subsequent accesses will have uh, data locality. Data locality similar to the way you had data locality in the first version of our big data ecosystem in which Hadoop, Hadoop scheduled compute jobs on the nodes where the data was present. In this case, uh, uh, Spark or any other compute framework is going to schedule uh, compute jobs on the Aluxio nodes where the data is cached for subsequent runs. Um, the second thing that Aluxio provides is uh, Aluxio acts as a, a, a layer to share data across different jobs. So if you run one Spark job and you run another Spark job which is reusing the same data, the data uh, in, in the middle doesn't have to be persisted back to uh, a slow object storage uh, and is persisted in uh, in Aluxio, uh, uh, is persisted in Aluxio. Okay, so uh, uh, let's talk about uh, how data locality is uh, achieved with Spark on top of Aluxio without Kubernetes. Uh, a typical workflow for Spark uh, launching jobs on Aluxio looks like what I have in this picture. So you. Uh, you have a Spark job uh, and the Spark driver. Uh, the Spark driver allocates uh, a talks to a resource manager such as Jan or, Me or Mesos to launch executors and uh, tasks on those executors. And then the executors itself, they access the data from an object storage uh, or any other form of storage which is remote. So uh, in, in this picture, you can see that since uh, uh, there is no Luxio in the picture and the storage is remote, there is no locality. Uh, and with Aluxio in the picture, uh, data locality, uh, the, the workflow for Spark works like what I have in this picture. So you submit a job, uh, the Spark context talks to the Aluxio client, uh, identifies where the location of the blocks are. For in this, in, uh, in this case, we, uh, the Spark job wants to access block one. Block one is located on host A. Uh, and uh, with this information, uh, Spark can schedule tasks on host A. Now, uh, once we have a task uh, scheduled on the host which contains the data, the next step is for the Aluxio client, which is part of the Spark executor, JVM, uh, to detect uh, that the Luxio worker from which it is accessing the data is local, and then to access that data efficiently uh, without going over the network stack. So uh, to not go over the network stack, Luxio has two mechanisms. Uh, one is that the Luxio client and the Luxio worker uh, share a local file system, or they go over domain socket, which is more efficient than going over the network stack. Uh, just a quick recap, there are, there are two steps for uh, achieving data locality with Spark on Aluxio. Uh, the first step is for Spark to schedule tasks on executors uh, co-located with the Aluxio workers, which have the data. And then once the task is scheduled to that node, uh, the Aluxio client detects that the worker is local and accesses the Aluxio worker using a path with a, using a mechanism without going through the network stack.
and that's what we call short circuit access. A quick overview of Kubernetes, uh, a couple of concepts that uh, we'll use uh, in this talk. Uh, as you all know, uh, Kubernetes is a container orchestration system, which makes it easy to deploy uh, and orchestrate different applications, such as Alexia and Spark. Uh, some of the features it provides is it provides an abstraction for the physical hardware. Uh, it provides storage orchestration, uh, which Alexia internally uses to manage local storage. And Alexia in turn uh, provides orchestration for uh, distributed storage on Kubernetes. So a couple of key terms. Uh, uh, a node uh, is the physical host itself. Uh, containers are, uh, let's say, a Docker image. A pod is a schedulable unit within Kubernetes. Uh, uh, and a controller uh, is something that controls uh, the desired number of replicas or the locations on which a pod should be launched. Daemon set is the kind of controller that Alexio will use in this talk, in which Alexio workers are deployed on each and every node in, in the Kubernetes cluster. Okay, uh, with that, uh, I'll move to uh, describing uh, the challenges that you uh, that we had the that we faced uh, by, for achieving data locality with Spark on top of Alexio in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, so Kubernetes. Uh, added, uh, Spark added Kubernetes support in 2.3. Uh, the architecture for Spark on Kubernetes uh, looks like what we have in the picture. Uh, the Spark uh, client, uh, when you submit a Spark job, uh, it talks to the API server, uh, launches the Spark driver on one of the nodes in the cluster. The Spark driver in turn talks to the API server to schedule executors. And then once the executors end up on the Kubernetes cluster, uh, tasks are scheduled on executors. Now, when you are deploying uh, Spark and Alexio in Kubernetes, uh, uh, the deployment model kind of looks like this. Uh, Spark executors are only uh, are ephemeral, so they last only for the lifetime of the Spark job, while Alexio workers persist as a daemon set in the cluster across your Spark job. So even if there are no Spark jobs running, there would be an Alexio worker uh, running on the Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, if you remember uh, from a couple of slides back, the first uh, thing uh, that happens when you launch uh, a Spark job on Alexio to achieve locality is that the Spark driver needs to uh, figure out which Alexio no to which executor is co-located with the Luxio worker which has the data. So in a, in a Kubernetes environment, uh, when you're using container networking, uh, the Luxio worker pods would have an IP which is different from the physical hosts. So uh, the solution to this problem is that Luxio workers use host networks. So when the Luxio workers advertise the location of the data, they would advertise the physical host as the location of the data. And uh, the second uh, part of this solution is that the Spark scheduler uh, for Kubernetes has privileges to map the executor to the physical host. So using the co a combination of uh, Luxio advertising the physical host address as the location of the data and the Spark driver being able to map the executor to the physical host Spark is able to schedule executors to the Luxio worker nodes, which have the data itself. Uh, the second, uh, now, once we have tasks which end up on the Kubernetes nodes, uh, which have the Luxio workers containing the data, the, the job at hand now is for the Luxio client, part of the Spark executor, to access the Luxio block uh, efficiently using uh, using a domain socket a domain socket access path which uh, doesn't go over the uh, doesn't go over the networking stack so uh, the way this uh, the luxio worker detects if uh, sorry the way an luxio client detects if an luxio worker is local 
in a non-Kubernetes environment is by using, uh, by comparing its, uh, uh, its host name with the Alexia worker host name. But since we are using uh, uh, virtualized networking for uh, the Spark executors, the, the IP for the Luxio client doesn't match the IP for the Luxio worker. Now, uh, to, and the other challenge is that uh, the Luxio worker, the Luxio client uh, does not have a uh, share a, a directory with the Luxio worker. To, uh, for both of these challenges, the solution that we have is uh, that we mount a host path volume, which is shared between the Luxio client, uh, which is the Spark executor and the Luxio worker. So there is a directory uh, which uh, is shared between Luxio workers and the Luxio client. Uh, each Luxio worker identifies itself with a unique ID so the domain uh, and the Luxio client accesses the uh, accesses the Luxio worker over uh, the domain socket path. So uh, the client would detect if the worker is local simply by looking at the file system, uh, and if it finds the unique ID for the Luxio worker on the file system uh, that it that's mounted uh, in the Spark executor, it knows that the Luxio worker is local and can access the Luxio worker over a domain socket. Uh, so this feature was something that was enabled in Spark uh, 2.4 by allowing uh, mounting of host path volumes to Spark executors. So uh, a quick recap, uh, the, 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 well, this is what the solution kind of looks like. Uh, the first stage was uh, Spark a being able to schedule tasks to, to uh, executors um, which contain the data. Uh, which was achieved by using host networking. And the second step was uh, accessing data efficiently, uh, which was done by using a host path volume on the Spark executors to detect uh, if a worker is local by looking at if the worker's UUID matches what is there on the Spark executor volume and then accessing it using, uh, using domain sockets. So uh, with that, uh, I'll just... Uh, talk about a couple of limitations of the solution that we have in place right now, uh, which is uh, that host networking and host path may not be available uh, in enterprise environments uh, because of some security vulnerabilities. Uh, for that, uh, we might uh, end up, so we have plans for uh, using lo local persistent volumes instead of host path volumes and also uh, implementing a translation between the host IP and the pod IPs in the Luxio client itself. So with that, we're going to switch gears uh, from Spark and uh, talk about uh, talk about Presto and, and also uh, some SQL uh, workloads on top of Luxio. So the first model of deployment which I uh, talked about was Luxio is pre-deployed, Alexio exists on the cluster, and then we launch uh, Spark executors, uh, to, uh, which are ephemeral uh, to, uh, for the lifetime of a job. Now, the other model of deploying Alexio in Kubernetes is that uh, in the right side picture, I have Presto and Alexio. Uh, Presto workers and Alexio workers would be in the same pod. And uh, when you schedule an Alux Presto worker, you would schedule an Aluxio worker co-located with the Presto, with, with Presto. Okay, uh, uh, with that, uh, uh, I'll hand it over to Gene, who's going to talk about uh, structured data management. Thanks, Adit. Um, so yeah, Adit uh, talked a lot about, about a lot of the work that we have done with Aluxio and and Spark and Kubernetes, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the new innovations that we have in Alexio that really tries to address and optimize for structured data such as you know, Spark and also Presto. So here's a short uh, motivation. When we looked at a lot of the use cases uh, for Alexio, um, as uh, Adit mentioned before, Alexio is a layer that um, is in between a lot of the applications and different store systems. And by doing this, Alexio can provide a unified interface and namespace, as well as being able to provide the locality 
and caching for the applications. And when we examined the, the applications, we noticed that a lot of these applications are actually dealing with structured data, are, are like SQL engines, uh, such as Presto, Spark, and, and Hive. And so we, yeah, we noticed a lot of the usages of Alexio are um, with structured data and SQL engines. So we decided to take a, a closer look at these, these types of workloads. And so ultimately there are two types of systems involved in this ecosystem. There are the storage systems and there are the SQL frameworks or SQL engines. And for storage systems, they are primarily, uh, primarily involved with the storage and serving of files and objects, directories, and raw, byte, raw bytes. And this is uh, very heavily skewed towards being storage optimized. On the other hand, for the applications and the SQL frameworks, they are primarily um, concerned with and, and dealing with data in tables and schemas, rows and columns, and it's, it's different, slightly different from what the storage systems are providing. So these SQL frameworks are really looking for compute optimized data. So ultimately there is an, a mismatch between what storage systems typically deal with and provide and what SQL frameworks and applications want, how they want to consume the data. And so with this mismatch, we actually see um, additional opportunities to further expand the benefits of what Alexia can provide in, in these ecosystems. So by taking a look at uh, the two, uh, two uh, parts of the ecosystem, the storage systems and the SQL frameworks, we see Alexia as, as a bridge between these two systems. And so as Adit and we have mentioned earlier, uh, Alexio already uh, provides the caching benefits and the unified interface and namespace benefits between these two systems that can help optimize for the SQL applications. So in addition to that, we think that being uh, having structured data management, uh, we can have schema-aware optimizations by understanding what how the data is structured and how the data is being uh, being uh, computed on. Additionally, we think that Alexia can provide compute optimized formats in order to, in order to present the data in uh, an optimized way for the applications and not necessarily optimized way for storage. And this ultimately leads to a, a, a powerful concept which is physical data independence, which means the, the, way, the way that storage systems store the data can be independent from the way that applications consume and, and, and compute on the data. So, uh, so this sort of leads to a high level philosophy of how structured data management would look like in, in Alexio. Uh, first is to be able to provide structured data APIs. And what this really means is to be able to focus on how these SQL frameworks want to interact with the data. Secondly, we want to cache the logical data access. Um, as opposed to the physical data access that storage systems provide. And this is really trying to focus on caching what frameworks and SQL engines want and how they want to compute on data. So here's a very high level uh, uh, overview of the architecture of Alexio structured data management. We have the storage systems on the left and we have the SQL engines on the right. <clears throat> and here in the middle, we view, we have several different components to the Alexio structured data management. So first we think, uh, first Alexio has a transformation service, which is important to provide the physical data independence. This is for um, converting and transforming the data that's in the storage optimized format and representation and transforming it into um, a compute optimized representation. Next we have structured data and metadata, and this is where we are storing the transformed data, as well as maintaining the metadata, necessary metadata uh, for that transformed data, and also um, managing the metadata for the tables and schemas um, information uh, for, the, for the clients. And lastly, the last uh, main component is the logical data access layer, which is essentially the, the client into all these various other components that we have in Alexio. So this is 
um, the client is what the SQL applications will be using in order to access the data um, uh, in Alexio, in the Alexio Structured Data Management System. So in the latest release of Alexio, uh, Alexio 2.1, we have a developer, pre developer preview of, this, uh, of these new features and components. And uh, this is the, the target environment for the developer preview, which is uh, for Presto. Uh, Presto is a SQL engine uh, um, that, uh, that runs on um, you know, various different environments. And in this specific environment, the typical use case is Presto talking to storage and the Hive Metastore. <clears throat> and it does that via the Hive connector within Presto. Uh, with the new Alexio Structured Data Management, we have uh, a new Alexio connector in Presto, which allows, the, um, which allows the connector and Presto to communicate with other Alexio services. One service that we have is the Alexio caching service. And so this is already part of um, Alexio uh, today, which we have mentioned from, from the beginning, where Alexio can cache a lot of the data that has been that is stored in the storage. Alexio Connector also uh, communicates with the Alexio Catalog Service, which maintains the metadata of various tables and schemas and database information. And this catalog service is what is communicating with the Hive Metastore. And we also have the Alexio Transformation Service, which is uh, uh, primarily responsible for transforming data that's in storage optimized formats and into a compute optimized format. So the Luxor Catalog Service, as I mentioned, is uh, primarily managing the metadata for structured data such as tables and, uh, and schemas. And it, it, it um, is able to, it, it has a concept of an under database, which is really an abstraction of other database catalogs in order to be able to connect to and uh, understand the schema information. So the main way to do this is essentially attaching an existing database um, or meta store into the catalog service to be able to uh, get that information. And the benefits that it provides is to be able to uh, have schema aware optimizations as well as simplify the deployment. Uh, there's also a new Alexio Presto connector, which uh, provides tighter integration with Presto, and it is uh, it is a it's heavily um, uh, based on the existing Hive connector in Presto, and it, today it's available in Alexio 2.1. And right now, as we speak, it is we are in the process of trying to merge this connector back into the Luxio, uh, the, the Presto code base. And lastly, there is the Alexio transformation service. And this transformation service, its primary goal is to transform data to be compute optimized. And this compute optimized format is independent from the storage optimized format. And this ultimately provides the, the physical data independence. So the two types of transformations that exist today in the developer preview is the coalesce feature, which is taking many small files and converting them into, or transforming them into uh, fewer files. And this is important because um, typically, when there are too many files um, in the storage, it can be inefficient to query through Presto. And secondly, there is a format conversion available uh, today in the, in, in the developer preview. And in the developer preview, we can convert CSV files into Parquet files. And that is because uh, Parquet files is more compute optimized format rather than CSV files, since that is just uh, plain text and more difficult to parse. So, uh, these are the two types of transformations that are available in order to convert data into be, to be more compute optimized. So now I will have a short demo on the Alexio, uh, uh, the new Alexio uh, features that I just talked about today. Um, so oh, actually, I have a short setup. So uh, in the demo, I have two clusters. Um, uh, on AWS, one has Presto and Hive Metastore and S3 data, and the other one is the same setup, but it ha also has Alexio. And in this data, we're using uh, just a simple data set on S3, and uh, some of the tables actually has uh, 10,000 CSV files, which is very inefficient. It's, it's um, very uh, not compute optimized, and so I will later show you how um, the transformations can help uh, optimize that data to be more compute optimized. 
So we have two clusters here today. Uh, the left, on the left, we have the cluster, the cluster with Presto and Alexio, and on the right, we have a cluster uh, with only Presto talking directly to the data. So first thing we're going to do is we will attach um, an existing Hive Metastore to the Alexio um, uh, structured data, the Alexio catalog service. And so here's the attach. Uh, command right now I'm running, and what this is doing is it's going to um, just simply communicate with the Hive Metastore and extract and, and get all that information that it needs to from the metadata. And so if you take a look at uh, the tables that's stored, it, it's, it's, it returns all the, 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 um, the data, all the tables that are in the TPC data set. So next, in that same cluster, let's take a look at how um, uh, Presto is configured, and so here you can see uh, it's a very simple way of, the, of, of connecting Presto to Alexio with the Cadillac service. Essentially, you just have to point it to the appropriate uh, location, and it will then communicate with the Alexio Cadillac service. And so once we start the Presto uh, CLI, we can uh, simply run show tables, and that shows the, the, the tables that are, is already in the Alexio Cadillac service. And we could also run a simple uh, query um, which reads from the item table uh, just a few rows, and that's reading uh, from the Alexio structured data uh, service. And so as I mentioned before, um, some of these tables are actually very uh, unoptimized for, c for computing on. And uh, store sales is one of those tables. And so what we're going to do is we're going to transform uh, the store sales to be more compute optimized. So we're going to kick off the transformation with this um, this transform table command, and this will kick off uh, a transformation. And if you take a look at um, the output directory, uh, right now it doesn't exist because right now the transformation um, is just starting. Uh, is just starting. So in in, in, a, in a, you know about you know 30 seconds or so it'll it'll finish up so while that is going let's take a look at the other cluster which only has presto and hive on 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 the right and here we will start up another presto cli and we will um show the tables and this is oh okay uh this will show um you know so now this presto is talking directly to hive nest or to the data. And so here we see you have the same set of tables. And so what we're going to do is we're going to run a query, uh, one of the TPC DS queries, on this data. And it does access the store sales table. And so here we will see it accessing um, directly these um, CSV files and, um, and showing how long it takes on just uh, Presto talking to Hive Metastore talking to S3 directly. So here, it took about 18 seconds uh, to finish here. And so uh, now let's go back to the Alexio cluster, the, uh, the cluster that has Alexio in it. And then we can s check out to see. OK, so now if we take a look at the data, we see that there is about 1.5 uh, gigs of data I I I that's uh, been transformed. And so if we run that same query uh, on this cluster, in the Alexio cluster, we will see now what what it's running is it's running on uh, it's reading the data from Alexio with the transform data. And here it took it took faster. It um, it took only seven seconds to read this data. And then if you take a look at it uh, down here, if we take a look at the the status of the files in Alexio, now we see that it's actually in a, in Alexio um, 100%. What that means is that. Um, for the first read, it was not cached yet, so that's why before it was not in Alexio. So here it was in 0%. But after the first query of the data, uh, it transparently caches that data in Alexio, and so now it's fully cached in Alexio. And so when we run the query one more time, uh, with uh, now reading the cache data, it's even faster than, that, uh, faster than before, which is now uh, about three seconds long. So we essentially went from about uh, almost 20 seconds to about six or seven seconds um, for the first read, and then three seconds uh, for the for the for the um, cached read. 
So uh, just to summarize what I did in the demo, um, I attached an existing Hive database into the Luxio catalog by, by the attach, uh, attach DB command. Uh, that Luxio catalog was able to serve all the necessary information and metadata to Presto, and then we transformed the store sales, store sales table by coalescing and converting CSV to Parquet uh, to optimize it, into, to, to, to transform the data to be compute optimized. And so with uh, the, for the summary, when there was no um, when there was no Alexio involved, it was like 18 to 20 seconds uh, running directly on the data, on basically the CSV data. After we transformed it uh, into fewer Parquet files, the, the transformations uh, went down to about seven seven seconds. And then after it was cached, uh, the resulting query was about uh, three seconds. So this shows the benefit of being able to provide compute optimized data and compute optimized metadata for for these SQL applications. So uh, yeah, this is um, uh, we have a developer preview in uh, Alexio 2.1, and we have um, you know uh, it, we're working with the, we we definitely want to work with the community to get feedback and, and be able to collaborate on. Uh, implementing new new features in, in this in this work, uh, we have uh, several new projects that uh, future projects that we are planning, such as new UDB implementations and conversion formats, and then also later being able to work with um, DDL and DML commands and new client APIs. And so, uh, finally, uh, it is available today in Alexa 2.1, which is the latest release. Um, we have the developer preview and. Uh, we would definitely love for people to try it out and provide feedback. So yeah, thank you very much. That is the end of uh, the, the entire talk. And so I guess now we can have some time for some questions. Um, yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, like Dean mentioned, we'll do questions right now. If you do have questions, please drop them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll go through as many as we can. It looks like there's a there are a few questions. Um, first question, um, is co-located Presto and Alexial Docker file publicly available? So uh, the the Docker file for Alexio and Presto is uh, not publicly available right now. Uh, it's in the works, so it should be available pretty soon for you to be able to deploy Presto and Alexio in Kubernetes. Perfect. Um, next question, is ORC format with ZSTD compression available? Um, for ORC, um, so with so today in the the structured data part of Alexio, um, if you don't run with transformations, then uh, all the existing formats that Hive uh, makes available is available to Presto. Now, if you do want to take advantage of some of the transformations that we have in in Alexio, then Today, ORC is not supported, but that's something that we uh, plan to support in the near future. Great. Okay, let's see. Um, when bursting compute into the cloud, how does Alexio manage um, cache data? Okay, uh, thanks for the question, Karen. So uh, when uh, we have uh, a compute cluster, let's say we begin with a compute cluster, which is entirely on-premise, uh, and then we start to use uh, compute in the cloud using, let's say, uh, federated Kubernetes or any other way in which you might have uh, joined uh, clusters both in the cloud and on-premise. So uh, what Alexio does is uh, the, the cache policy in Alexio uh, allows you to cache data on access. So initially when you have a bunch of jobs running on-premise, Alexio will cache all of the data on the nodes which are on-premise. And then once you start uh, running jobs in the cloud, Alexio will start caching data locally. So once the jobs are run in the, on the cloud, um, Alexio will start caching data on the nodes uh, in, on which the compute job is running itself. 
Cool. Um, let's see what else. Um, how are the transformations performed? Yes, for the structured data management, um, Alexio uh, utilizes something we call the, the job service within Alexio to be able to do the transformations. And what that is, is it's, um, it's a simple uh, um, distributed computation framework to be able to read data and do some operations on that data and then write out data. So uh, these, um, these, the, tra the Alexio transformations uh, reuses the Alexio job service in order to perform these specific transformations. <coughs> um, okay, in co-located Presto and Alexio, what should be the percentage of memory, RAM, allocated to Presto and Alexio separately? So, uh, the, the short answer is uh, it depends. Uh, it depends on the kind of queries that you're running with, Spar with Presto. Um, I would say that if your Presto queries are highly compute intensive, uh, then uh, Alexio can be configured to use uh, what we call tiered storage. So Alexio can be configured to use SSDs or HDDs instead of RAM so that your Presto queries can benefit from the additional RAM that's available to it. But if your Presto queries are more IO intensive, then it makes sense to allocate more RAM to Alexio so that, um, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, your jobs can benefit from IO acceleration. So a good, uh, a good point to start with would be, I would say like one third of your memory, start with one third of your memory for Alexio. And depending on your jobs, you can uh, tune uh, the amount of memory available for Alexio up or down. Um, okay, so this is, I guess kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, since both are memory heavy tools, is it good to have Alexio and Presto together or is it best for these two to be installed separately? So, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, Alexio can be configured uh, to not use memory heavily, um, and, uh, but it does typically make sense to deploy Alexio and Presto together. Okay, great. Um, let's see what else. Does Presto have access to both Alexio catalog service and Hive Metastore? I see. Um, so uh, with, the, with the new Alexio structured data services that we have uh, in the newest Alexio, um, if you use the Alexio connector in Presto, then the Alexio connector will only communicate with the Alexio catalog service. And uh, it will, um, the Alexio catalog service will communicate with the Hive Metastore. So if the Alexio catalog, if the Alexio connector is used in Presto, then Presto will only communicate with the cal Alexio catalog service and not directly with the Hive Metastore. Okay, um, there's another question. What about H8 and Alexio? How do you handle it? So um, there are different modes in Alexio uh, to uh, for HA, uh, uh, I'll restrict my answer specifically to uh, Kubernetes environment. Uh, in Kubernetes for HA, uh, we have something called uh, embedded journal, which is our mechanism for uh, high availability. Um, so what you would do is that you would launch uh, multiple Alexio masters, uh, and uh, the Alexio masters uh, run a consensus algorithm amongst themselves, and the Alexio would elect uh, a master as a primary. So there's no uh, dependency on an external system like Zookeeper uh, for leader election. The Alexio masters have, it, uh, have the logic baked in the Alexio master itself, and they can choose a leader. So um, the Alexio masters uh, choose a leader, and uh, in for HA, um, the Alexio masters uh, use a local persistent volume uh, as the journal so that uh, across restarts of an Alexio master, the journal is preserved and a secondary master uh, can also uh, become primary and serve the latest state uh, using the journal quickly. Great. 
Um, let's see. Okay, if I'm using ORC files, can I use Alexio structured data service? Um, yeah, so uh, when, uh, so if you use the Alexio structured data service, then um, it can still um, present all the data that Hive, that Hive presents. So if Hive has a bunch of ORC files, then the Alexio structured data service and Alexio catalog will still uh, work with those data. Now, if you want to transform that data, then the transformations, there are some limitations such as, you know, converting from CSV to Parquet and things like that. But, um, but we are in the future going to support additional formats for transformations itself. So if you don't use transformations, then, um, then all the formats that, are, are, that work today will continue to work. Great. Um, how does Alexio manage data security or DLP? Um, so I'm not sure what DLP means, but uh, Alexio has, um, you know, uh, ACL, so it has an uh, access control list. It has um, uh, simple ways of doing uh, authorization for the for the data. Uh, the DLP meaning data loss prevention. <laughs> oh, I see. And so, yeah, so that's that's for security. Uh, for um, for some uh, for the for loss pre for data loss prevention, I guess one um, uh, an important uh, uh, an important characteristic of Alexio is that the data persistence is is um, is handled by the under file system layer, which means whatever the storage system is below Alexio, that is responsible for the persistence of data. So Alexio essentially um, is not responsible for the persistence, but the underlying data is. So you can essentially see, uh, view the storage system as like the source of truth, and Alexio is essentially uh, either caching it or providing some sort of transform, transformed version of that data, but ultimately the data is persisted in the store system. So uh, Alexio, uh, so basically the store system itself, the store systems themselves have to provide that data loss prevention. Great. Um, how is cache lifecycle managed? Are there supports for external cache providers? Uh, for uh, the life cycle of the cache, uh, like I mentioned uh, earlier on in the talk, Alexio does provide uh, certain data management features, uh, which allows you to set policies uh, for how to migrate data from one storage system to the other and between the Luxio cache. So if you're accessing data from, uh, let's say, HDFS, uh, and it's being stored in a Luxio storage, a Luxio managed storage such as memory or SSDs, and you eventually want to migrate it to uh, a storage system, an object storage system like Amazon S3, uh, you can set certain policies which would determine the life cycle uh, of the data based on access. Um, okay, a few more questions. Um, is there any plan to support AWS Glue? Mm. Uh, yes, there are plans. It's not there yet right now, but uh, we are. Um, that is in the, uh, the that is in the near future to be able to support uh, Glue as another um, under database connection for the catalog service. Yes. Okay. In addition to Hive tables, can I import tables from databases like MySQL? Um, so today, the only supported UDB is the Hive uh, Metastore, but, uh, uh, but I think it could be uh, pretty reasonable to implement a UDB implementation for, um, for MySQL itself. So that would mean that uh, Alexia could provide um, these same similar services, such as caching and transformations, for tables in MySQL themselves. So uh, it's not there yet right now, but um, that is something that we, uh, you know, may implement in the future. Okay. Um, how long does the cache live? Um, I.e., does does the work or do the workers die at some point with no more computations? So, uh, 
typically the way Alexio is deployed, the Alexio workers are uh, long running. Uh, the work so the workers do not die when there are no more computations, but uh, the the storage that is managed by the Luxio workers, you can set policies on that. So what you can do is you could say that cache data only for one hour, or you could say cache data only for a day. Great. Okay, um, I think those are all the questions. Thank you, Gene and Adit, for a great presentation. Um, I think that's all the time we have for today. Thank, every thank you everyone for joining us today. The webinar recordings and slides will be online later today. And we are looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, bye.